Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here at our second talk of the year in the Virtual Digital Economy Seminar. Christian will moderate today's session, and uh, he will also introduce uh, our guest in just a second. As always, uh, uh, very minor administrative details. Please send any clarifying questions to everyone in the chat window throughout the talk. Christian will then manage the queue and interrupt the speaker at a convenient time for you to ask a question. If you prefer, of course, Christian can also ask the question for you. We will also collect all remaining questions for the Q&A after the talk in the general chat, so don't hesitate to post any questions at any time. And uh, finally, today's session will be recorded, so if you do ask a question, you will also appear in the recording. And oh yes, finally, finally, um, so uh, to make it a bit more interactive, feel free to turn on your camera. Of course, uh, it's up to you, uh, but to give the speaker a bit more of an interactive experience. So um, Christian, the screen is yours. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Hannes. Um, welcome everyone, also from my side. It's my great pleasure to introduce Hung Jin Kim from INSEAD Singapore. Um, it's uh, actually midnight uh, in Singapore right now, so we really appreciate that you uh, go go the full distance uh, to be in the White Seminar today. Um, Kinjun is, um, I would say, a rising star uh, in the in the digital economy uh, research world. Um, she um, has a PhD from uh, uh, HBS, um, and you know, been to all the places: uh, LSE, Oxford, uh, a, a BA from from Harvard, um, and I, and I think also she has um, you know um, uh, a very impressive uh, pipeline, and uh, it, I think it's just going to be a, a matter of a of a few more years um, uh, of bursting this pipeline. And uh, one of these very nice papers is, I guess, the one that uh, she will present today. So, without further ado, Hyunjin. Um, thanks so much for, for coming, and the screen is all yours. Oh, great. Okay, thanks so much. I wasn't able to unmute a little bit before. Um, and hello, everyone. It's really great to see you all, um, and it's so nice to see uh, so many familiar names uh, and faces. And thank you so much to Christian and Hannes for uh, inviting me to present. Uh, I really enjoyed watching some of the talks in this seminar, and it's very exciting to be on the other side. And of course, thank you for that very kind introduction. So today I'll be presenting on decision authority and the returns to algorithms, which is joint work with Ed Glazer, Andrew Hillis, Scott Commoners, and um, Mike Luca. And this is very much a work in progress, so I would really appreciate any questions or comments that you, you might have. Okay. So in recent years, there's been growing interest in using algorithms to support uh, decision making. And firms have been increasingly investing in various applications of algorithms across the organization. Now, of course, one area where there's been a lot of adoption is in automating operational decisions um, like customer support or pricing or decisions under the hood of online platforms like product recommendations and advertising. And in these areas where algorithms automate decisions, algorithmic sophistication seems to by and large uh, help improve our operations by providing gains in terms of efficiency as well as scale and speed. Um, but many organizations are also increasingly interested in using algorithms to inform their managerial decisions. And in these contexts, algorithms often provide predictions that managers then take as potential inputs to the decisions that they make, rather than automating the decision making itself. So for example, a growing number of companies are using algorithms to, uh, that provide recommendations for hiring managers to screen applicants to interview and to hire. Uh, manufacturing firms are using algorithms to identify plants that are most at risk of equipment damage or um, a safety incident, which then informs their resource investment decisions. And pharmaceutical companies are increasingly uh, using algorithms uh, to identify promising drugs for further R&D. And what often distinguishes these contexts from some of the operational decisions that I mentioned earlier is that managers retain decision authority, as in the right to make the final decision after looking at uh, the algorithmic inputs. 
And a lot of managers and, and firms are increasingly interested in making investments in more data um, and more algorithmic sophistication, uh, citing uh, data availability and technical capabilities as a key challenge to adopting AI across uh, the many surveys that have been done recently. And yet there's evidence that many firms might not be seeing the returns to their investments, especially in some of these more managerial areas. And so this raises a question on uh, the extent to which algorithmic sophistication improves uh, managerial decisions. And this is the key research question that we focus on in this paper. Now, of course, there's a growing literature around this topic that I can't fully do justice to here. Uh, so what I wanna do is highlight some of the most related literature, which raises some ambiguity uh, on this question around the impact of algorithmic sophistication for managerial decisions. So on the one hand, uh, there's been growing excitement in the promise of algorithms to improve decisions. And scholars since the 50s have highlighted how algorithms can help reduce human error and also increase consistency in decisions. And there's this more broader uh, assumption that more information is going to lead to more accurate decisions. And there's a lot of recent work that's looked at decisions in judicial contexts and in hiring that look at how algorithmic predictions perform and suggest that algorithms help ultimately help improve these decisions. And what this uh, view broadly suggests is that richer data and algorithmic sophistication should um, fuel better predictions that should ultimately help improve decisions. But there are also some reasons to believe that investing in algorithmic sophistication might have some limited gains for managerial decisions. So the first reason is that it might be that the returns, even in terms of prediction, are limited in these contexts, given that these contexts often involve a high degree of uncertainty. So research on heuristics has highlighted that in context with high uncertainty, simple rules of thumb that actually ignore some of the information that's available might lead to better decisions than complex analytical tools. And this really gets more broadly at the bias variance trade-off. And it might be that managers also have some private information that allows them to, um, to predict better, especially in some of these contexts. Now, a second reason is that when we leverage data and algorithms for managerial decisions, decision makers ultimately choose to use algorithmic recommendations um, to help uh, aid their decisions rather than taking them as a decision rule. And so what this means is uh, that they might use their decision authority uh, to make a decision that ultimately doesn't leverage any of the potential prediction gains that can come from algorithmic sophistication. And there might be different ways in which this can happen. So on the one hand, it could be that they actively use their discretion to dissipate any of the informational gains. Work in psychology has shown that we often prefer not to rely on algorithms in various contexts. Uh, and, uh, and we've characterized this as algorithm aversion. And there's also been some work since that builds on this uh, that suggests that there are also contexts where we prefer algorithms more compared to humans. And of course, some of these preferences might simply evolve over time as we use more algorithms in different contexts. But beyond just preferences alone, this is consistent with this broader idea that managers might be overconfident, which can lead them to actively dissipate informational gains from algorithms because of bias or, or potentially mistakes that they make. Now, on the other hand, there is also good reason why uh, decision makers in managerial contexts might use their discretion to reject algorithmic recommendations. So most managerial problems have richer and more complex objective functions than can be captured by most algorithms today. And so what this means is that many managers and organizations often have to balance many different objectives to make, them, to make their decisions. And they have contextual knowledge on what these objectives are and what the relative weights that are that need to be placed upon them. And this is of course one key reason why we often want managers to oversee algorithmic predictions as an input to their broader decisions. Um, and so even if algorithms provide better predictions, it might be that managers are not able to take advantage of them to improve their decision because this would make the decision worse in terms of some of these other dimensions. 
And while there's been a lot of research on the theoretical promise of algorithms, there's been much less work in terms of um, on this issue of algorithmic sophistication and the practical implementation of these algorithms in real organizational contexts. And one of the challenges, of course, is being able to understand the quality of the algorithm that's being deployed in, a, in any given context and potentially even varying its degree of sophistication. And as many firms increasingly consider investing in data and algorithms, it's important to evaluate what the returns to this might be and how decision makers actually use their discretion when using these algorithmic inputs in order to better understand how uh, organizations can more productively invest in these decision tools in practice. So in this paper, we use experimental evidence from an organizational context where decision makers are making um, uh, resource allocation decisions. Now, I'll tell you much more about the setting in a second, but basically these are inspectors making decisions on how to allocate their scarce time to inspect restaurants. And what we do is we compare the performance of human predictions to algorithmic predictions. And then we also compare uh, two algorithms with varying degrees of sophistication. And then we examine the ultimate decisions that decision makers make and evaluate it across various organizational objectives in this context. And to give you a preview of what we find, we find that algorithms do in fact provide large gains in terms of prediction, which is consistent with a lot of prior work. But uh, what we see is that the greatest gains come from simply integrating data into the decision process rather than from algorithmic sophistication when we compare these two algorithms. And yet we find that any improvements in prediction ultimately don't translate into improvements in decisions. Um, we see that decision makers often reject algorithmic recommendations, and we find little evidence that they do this to improve the decision according to some of the other organizational objectives that might be in play. And so broadly, what these findings suggest is that even though organizations can improve decision making from using algorithms, managing decision authority might be at least as important as investing in more data or algorithms, at least in some of these early days of putting algorithms into practice. Okay, so before I dive in, are there any questions so far? Not, not at this moment. Great, thanks. Um, all right, so I'll dive into the setting a little bit more. Uh, we partner with an inspectional services department in a large US city uh, to basically look at restaurant health inspection decisions. And this is a setting where decision makers are making decisions on which restaurants to inspect. And the setting has a couple of compelling features to evaluate what the impact of implementing algorithms on decision-making practice might be. So the first thing is that this department had a very clear primary objective, uh, which has some uncertainty, but is essentially a prediction problem, much like predicting the potential success of a hire, a pharmaceutical drug, um, or, or the risk of a plant, they were interested in predicting which restaurants are most likely to have health violations uh, so that they could shut them down. Now, in principle, of course, uh, an inspectional services department um, could have a, another objective, which is to try to deter restaurants from committing any violations in the first place. But in this one, and actually a lot of the other departments that we spoke to, their number one goal was this prediction problem rather than deterrence. And this was really because if some restaurants are going to violate anyway, and the department is running behind on their inspections, which is often the case, they want to better allocate their resources to flag and correct restaurants that pose the highest risk to public health as quickly as possible. But um, in addition to this primary goal, they also had other secondary objectives that they cared about. So this included uh, conducting inspections that were close to each other so that they could reduce some of the costs of travel um, and also targeting more overdue inspections, uh, targeting restaurants that were more committing uh, that, that were committing more serious violations. And a nice feature is that in this setting, these secondary goals were clear across the organization and they were measurable, which really gave us the opportunity to look at how these decision makers are using their discretion when they're faced with these different objectives and, and working with the algorithmic inputs. Um, there's also a lot of easily accessible data in this setting. 
So the city has historical administrative data on inspections, and there's also data from digital platforms like Yelp or TripAdvisor or Twitter that provide a lot of detailed insights into restaurants. And all of this raises the possibility of helping to improve algorithmic sophistication. And then this is also a setting where decision makers retain ultimate decision authority based on these predictions because they then carry out these inspections themselves. And one of the reasons that inspectors have decision authority is because many of them have been working with the city for several years. Um, and they have deep knowledge about these businesses as well as uh, the health violations that they make. So in general, these departments believe that there's a lot of private knowledge that these inspectors hold on both predicting who is likely to have a violation at a given time, as well as uh, the broader context in terms of the multiple objectives that they, that they really care about. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that inspectors are motivated to prioritize restaurants that pose the highest risk, both because it can play a role in terms of their career advancement and because uh, if they have complaints that come in ex post, this increases their workload by triggering inspections that need to happen within a specific time period on top of their normal inspections. And then finally, better targeting inspections has a direct effect on performance um, by helping to improve efficiency. So in this department, their policy is to conduct two inspections per restaurant each year, but inspectors are often running behind and they're not able to conduct all of the inspections. And in this case, more than 60% of the restaurants were not inspected as much as they should have been. So it's, it's especially important to better allocate inspector scarce time. Now, to give you a sense of why it matters to prioritize restaurants with violations, uh, there's a pretty large variation in the number of violations that are found across restaurants in these inspections. So this shows you the number of violations, weighted violations that were found across inspections between uh, 2007 and 2015. Um, and inspectors found anywhere from zero to 60 weighted violations per inspection. And to give you a sense of what this means, um, level one violations, which have a weight of one point, are, uh, are non-critical violations like um, building defects or standing water. Level two violations are more critical violations uh, that are likely to lead to food contamination or illness, uh, like the presence of fruit flies. And then level three violations are the most serious violations with the highest weight of five points. Um, and these are violations that are considered to be foodborne illness risk factors. Uh, so you can think about this as insufficient refrigeration, um, a lack of allergen advisories on menus, um, or really just as many rats in the kitchen. So having even just 10 or 20 weighted violations can be quite serious for public health. Um, and in and, and thinking about you know, what it means for a restaurant to have say 40 or 60 violations would be super serious in terms of the violations that they're, that they're committing. This is like tons of rats in the kitchen. Okay, so within this context, oh, sorry, is there a question? Yes, uh, Hannes has a question. Hi, uh, maybe maybe we can also hold that off uh, to later because you might say more about the objective function. So, so uh, uh, the question was on the previous slide um, about the secondary priorities. I mean, they they sound like reasonable uh, things an inspector might worry about. So I was wondering um, if if this is not just a, I don't know misspecification of uh, the objective function or or but but maybe this will be I don't know it's really more clear when you talk about decision authority. So who who establishes the objective? Yes, so here uh, the, the key objective is this first one in terms of predicting and flagging which restaurants are most likely to have violations. But exactly as you say, the reason that I mentioned these secondary priorities and they're sort of known to be secondary priorities is that the department doesn't want inspectors to be traveling all across the county to conduct their inspections. Um, they also want them to target more overdue inspections and, and, and those that are committing more serious violations. So one of the things that we are getting at here is this possibility that 
um, that one of the reasons that managers or decision makers in these managerial contexts might not be able to follow algorithmic recommendations is because the objective function of the algorithm is misspecified, exactly as you say. Most uh, algorithms today uh, can't account for these multiple objectives. So it might be that when we see inspectors, or in this case, uh, rejecting algorithmic recommendations, they're doing this because it would make it make the decision so much worse in terms of some of these secondary objectives that also matter. And so that's one of the reasons that we're looking at this context, because we can actually uh, measure uh, how they're performing in terms of these secondary objectives to see how is it that these decision makers are choosing to work with these algorithmic inputs that can really only maximize this uh, primary objective about predicting the restaurants with the highest number of violations. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So within this context, uh, we compared three methods to predict violations. Uh, the first one is really just business as usual. So this is where inspectors alone prioritize restaurants um, based on uh, what they believe the likelihood of the restaurant to violate, to, to commit health violations might be. The second is what we call a data poor algorithm. And so this basically took a simple average across historical violations to rank restaurants in terms of their likelihood uh, to commit violations. And then the last is what we call a data rich algorithm. So this was sourced from an open contest that was run across around um, 700 machine learning engineers, where they were awarded financial prizes of a couple thousand dollars based on the quality of their prediction in terms of the number of violations that they predicted. And the algorithm that we use here was one of the winning solutions from this contest, uh, which was a random forest model trained on the universe of all of the historical data, um, historical administrative data, um, as well as data from Yelp, including all of the review text, the star ratings, um, all of the available business attributes, and the attributes of the user who provided each review. And then every two weeks over a period of two months, inspectors received a docket of restaurants that they needed to inspect. And this docket basically had the top ranked restaurants from each of the three different approaches to targeting inspections, which was sorted in random order. So the idea behind this design was to help address a couple of challenges in understanding the effect of algorithms um, and algorithmic sophistication in practice. So the first is that we observe both what inspectors' predictions are and their ultimate decisions in which restaurants to inspect. And this helps us better understand what counterfactual inspector decisions might have been. And then second, whenever we evaluate the impact of algorithms across different empirical settings, it's often difficult to understand how the quality um, or the sophistication of the algorithm that's being tested uh, in, in, in that uh, empirical context actually impacts the results. So this is something that we explicitly vary here in, in of course, somewhat of a crude, uh, crude way. And then the dockets provide a mechanism that exogenously influences which restaurants are inspected when. So, now, so Linden, I think there's a there's a question by Eileen Nielsen. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I, I was wondering, can you provide some context regarding um, the data poor algorithm? I know that certainly in some work environments, this is sort of data I would expect to just be on the mind of the human anyway. So to what extent is this something uh, you expect them to be aware of, or did you have evidence that they were they didn't have easy access to this sort of data? Um, when it's just some sort of historical average? Yeah, thanks so much for the question. So I completely agree with you. I think that was actually our prior going into this as well. So this is actually data that is easily available uh, within the organization. Um, and so we expected these decision makers to have uh, some sense of what the averages might be. And, and so this is sort of us, I think, trying to think about how can we vary, you know, what it might mean to have some of these algorithmic recommendations. Because one of the, I think, key insights from some of even the very early literature is that even these uh, very simple heuristics can help improve in terms of consistency and reducing some of the human error that might be present. Thanks. Um, 
Even though we advise on this empirical design, the city made the final design choices and executed on the implementation. And there were some implementation issues. So what we do is we focus our main analyses on the full set of restaurants that were inspected and ranked in the top 20 uh, by any method. And this basically allows us to compare inspection outcomes across more comparable rankings in each method. Um, but the results don't change much, having said this, uh, when we vary this threshold or look across the full sample of inspected restaurants. So what we do is we look at the number of violations that are found in the inspections, and then we compare the number of violations across restaurants that were uh, ranked highly by the inspectors um, alone versus the data rich algorithm alone or the data poor algorithm alone. And then we also separate out restaurants that were ranked highly by multiple methods. All right, so what do we find? Uh, we find that there are quite substantial gains from algorithms in predicting uh, restaurants with violations, as we've seen across a couple of different settings where we have empirically tested you know, what the impact of algorithms might be. Um, so here, inspector ranked restaurants find approximately uh, seven violations and algorithms flag over 50 to 70% more violations compared to inspectors alone, uh, depending on how we separate out each of the methods. So what you see here is that restaurants that are ranked highly by multiple methods, um, either in terms of both algorithms or all three methods, flag restaurants with double the number of violations compared to inspectors alone. Um, and both the data rich and the data poor algorithms uh, alone flag restaurants with about four or five violations compared to the ones that inspectors alone prioritized. And this is equivalent to having um, one violation at the highest level, which is considered foodborne illness risk factors. But as you can see, the largest gains stem from using simple heuristics rather than algorithmic sophistication. So the simple algorithm, which are these simple averages, shows no statistically significant difference from the data rich algorithm, even though the data rich algorithm used both richer data and a more sophisticated algorithm. And the difference between uh, the point estimates for the two algorithms in both of the specifications here suggest that the gains in our setting came from integrating really any data into the process rather than using more data or more sophisticated algorithms. But I should say that we interpret this with some caution because we're underpowered here and can't rule out say larger differences. And of course, it's important to emphasize that this is just one context. And it's difficult to generalize from this specific context to all managerial context. So the main insight that we draw from this is that even very simple data was valuable in improving predictions in this case. And there might be similar managerial contexts where this is also the case. Now, despite these large gains from algorithms, uh, we find that inspectors are much less likely to inspect restaurants that are recommended by the algorithms. So what you see here is that they inspected only about half of the restaurants that were prioritized by the algorithms relative to the ones that were based on their own predictions. So they're not able to capture some of the informational gains that, that are created by uh, using algorithms in the first place. And when we look across inspectors, we observe some but very limited heterogeneity. Now, of course, this poses a potential threat to validity because this means that we observe the violation results for only a subset of the restaurants on each docket. Okay, actually, let me just pause here for a second because I think there might be another question. Uh, right, yeah, Pallavi Pal has a question. Let me just unmute her. There you go. Hi. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, you're about to talk about the point that I, I'm trying to make, but yeah, my point was just that since they're like cherry picking some restaurants out of the one that was suggested by these data-driven methods, these results might be, you know, biased in that sense that there is some selection going on. So they might pick the ones that they also think um, for other factors might have high violations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for teeing up exactly um, uh, what I'm going to talk about next, which is exactly the concern that you're raising, um, that, that this really poses a threat to internal validity because of course, this means that we observe the violation results for only a subset of the restaurants that are on each docket. 
And this would be especially concerning if inspectors have private information about which restaurants are most likely to have violations. And they are super sophisticated about cherry picking restaurants with the highest violations from the algorithmically generated lists. Um, and this is because this would mean that we might be picking up on a selection effect that's driven not by observing the outcomes for restaurants that were ranked lower by the algorithms rather than an actual treatment effect. Now, although this is a possibility, it seems unlikely given the patterns that we observe that uh, selection is likely to change the results that we observe, at least directionally. So first, if inspectors were using private information to find the worst restaurants, then we would expect that the restaurants that the inspectors alone rank highly should have the highest violations. But as I showed you earlier, we find that restaurants on their list have much fewer violations compared to either of the algorithm based lists. And what this suggests is that, um, you know, th that at least at the margin, it would have made sense for them to drop some of the restaurants that they inspected on their list and substitute with the ones that were on the algorithm list. So it doesn't appear that they're really close to using their private knowledge to maximize trade-offs at the margin. But to examine this, this further, we also look directly at whether they're disproportionately targeting restaurants with the most violations uh, that are ranked by the algorithms. So Yunji, there's, there's actually... Um discussion about maybe corruption. So maybe Tommy, you can expand on that. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, uh, I was thinking about it kind of related to what you just talked about is that they, uh, there may be some private incentives for the inspector to choose some restaurants to inspect. Like uh, I just Google, uh, uh, restaurant inspection, New York City corruption, and I found a, a news news article like late last year about the uh, yeah inspector taking bribe. So uh, uh, I don't know how common is that, but uh, it it may be something that yeah uh, that you might want to think about, or if you you may already have thought about that too, already. So. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for that. Um, I will talk through all the like what what might be happening here, and definitely one of the reasons that you that that uh, that could be ha that, that 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 could be an, a, uh, at work here is what you mentioned. Um, what we think is that even though that's possible, it's it's less likely in this particular context because inspectors were reassigned to a completely new area every two years and in general they only got to to one to a given restaurant you know at, um, at, um, maximum once sort of within that period so it doesn't seem likely that they had sufficient time to build relationships although it is definitely a possibility and then I'll sort of talk a little bit more in a second about what some of the other reasons that could be driving this might be. So let me just first tell you before I get there about um, you know, some of the other patterns that we see that suggest that selection is unlikely to change some of these results, at least directionally. So here uh, in the first column of this table, we look at differences in terms of average ranking by each method for the restaurants that were inspected. So if it were the case that inspectors were selectively targeting algorithm ranked restaurants that had a higher high, uh, likelihood of violation, then we should see that the average ranking of restaurants on the algorithmic lists are higher, as in like they're a smaller number because we're ranking them from the, the highest number of violations to, to the least. Um, but the point estimates here are positive, suggesting that there's a slight bias in the opposite direction with restaurants that are ranked by inspectors alone occupying higher ranking positions compared to the ones that are ranked by algorithms, even though the, the, the differences are small and statistically insignificant. And so what this suggests is that the results seem unlikely to be driven by observing different parts of the ranking distribution for each method, that we're basically just seeing the, the, the worst restaurants on the algorithm lists. And then second, we explore if the gains from algorithms are emerging from a particular part of the ranking distribution. So for example, it might be that you know, just the few restaurants at the very top are driving uh, the observed gains that we see here. Um, and we do this by analyzing whether the, the, the gains from algorithms vary across rank. 
But we see here that the gains from algorithms appear to be spread across the ranking distribution because the coefficients um, that we interact with rank are fairly small. Um, they are slightly positive and also noisy. And so these results together suggest that the performance differences that we observe between the algorithms and the inspectors are unlikely to be at least fully explained by selection or that selection is likely to change some of these results directionally. Now, all this said, of course, one key limitation is that we don't know about the restaurants that inspectors don't visit. So it remains possible that in terms of the magnitude, the predictive power of the algorithm uh, of, of the algorithms among the ones that they inspected is different from the predictive power in the full set. Uh, and so the, the, the exact uh, magnitude of the estimates might might potentially differ. So, of course, all of this raises the question, why did inspectors not follow the algorithmic recommendations? So to look at this, we first explore whether inspectors use their decision authority to actually improve the decision in terms of other organizational objectives. So like we were talking about with Hannes earlier, is it the case that they were thinking about also some of these other objectives that might be at play? But we find little supportive evidence that inspectors made economically or statistically significant improvements in each of these dimensions. So first, we look at whether inspectors were balancing geographic distance so that they could reduce uh, the, their costs of travel. Um, but we find that inspectors on average had an algorithmically ranked restaurant that was much closer than the one that they decided to visit next. And then second, we look at whether inspectors place higher weight on restaurants with more serious violations. So it might be that they targeted restaurants that have sort of that highest weight of violations that I talked, to, talked about earlier. But we find that algorithms identify restaurants with more violations on average in all three risk categories compared to inspectors. So this suggests that inspectors were not placing higher weight on higher risk violations. And then we also look at whether inspectors were prioritizing more overdue inspections uh, or more popular restaurants. But we don't find an economically or statistically significant difference um, in either of these. And so these findings provide little supportive evidence that inspectors use their private contextual knowledge to improve their, the decisions with respect to other objectives. And they raise this question of why inspectors actually deviated. Now, it's also possible that um, other explanations like algorithm aversion um, or you know, some version of regulatory capture, as we just talked about, um, might explain some of these patterns. But we think that they're less likely to explain the results in this context for a couple of reasons. So in terms of algorithm aversion, um, you know, which is really uh, this idea that the same prediction, the same information, um, if it's made salient that it's coming from an algorithm rather than a human, is something that is uh, likely to get rejected by decision makers. Um, in this case, the department chose to not explicitly communicate that these recommendations were driven by algorithms so that they could uh, reduce the likelihood of triggering um, algorithm aversion. And instead, what they communicated was that these were informed by the data team uh, in the department. And this also seems less likely because inspectors were quite excited about the prospect of using data, at least at the outset. And then another explanation is, of course, some form of regulatory capture here, but we think that it might have been harder for these uh, inspectors to build these relationships with inspectors in time because they're reallocated to a completely new area and the majority of restaurants were inspected once a year or less. Um, so I should say here that this is not the result that we or the department anticipated. We thought that inspectors were deviating from algorithms because of some of these objectives, especially a geographic distance. So when we found this to be the case, we collected some anecdotal evidence talking to inspectors. And of course, this is very speculative. But what this seems to broadly suggest is that inspectors um, had uh, developed some simple rules of thumb that they used to prioritize restaurants. So for example, they believe that chain restaurants, restaurants that serve seafood um, and lower end businesses were more likely to have violations. And we find descriptive statistics that are consistent with this interpretation that inspectors over prioritize these features relative to algorithms in both their predictions and the restaurants that they ultimately chose to inspect. And this suggests that they might have potentially overridden algorithmic recommendations when they conflicted with some of these simple rules. And it raises the possibility that these simple rules that decision makers develop that might even have helped them in the past could end up as an impediment when using algorithms for decision making. 
So broadly, our findings from this pilot suggest that, at least in some cases, algorithmic sophistication might have limited returns and that decision authority might deserve a deeper consideration. But of course, this evidence really stems from a single context. So to explore the extent to which these findings might generalize and also to get a sense of uh, how departments like this more broadly think about algorithmic sophistication and decision authority, we contacted inspectional departments across the largest 100 counties in the US uh, to conduct some interviews. And we were able to interview 53 departments to explore how they prioritize their inspections, uh, whether they've used data and algorithms to guide their process, and how much importance they place on providing inspectors with decision authority if they were to work with, say, some version of data and algorithms. And what we found was that, you know, number one, very few of the departments had attempted using data to guide their inspections. Uh, the vast majority had not, even though a lot of them expressed a lot of interest. And the key reason that they mentioned was that um, they would need access to much more data, like from Google or from Twitter, and that they needed technical capability to generate sophisticated algorithms to see any returns. And because they didn't have these resources, they hadn't tried uh, using data to guide their inspections. And interestingly, this echoes similar responses among managers in some of these recent surveys who list data availability or technical uh, capability as some of the greatest challenges for adopting AI. And second, over 70% of the departments believe that providing inspectors with decision authority to oversee some of these algorithms uh, would be of the highest priority. And they mentioned two key reasons that map on to what I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. You know, number one, that these inspectors have deep firsthand knowledge of businesses that can improve prediction, say, in terms of who the frequent violators are or um, you know, seasonality, like the baseball season and how it could affect when businesses might be most likely to violate. And that second, that inspectors have this contextual knowledge on other objectives that matter that algorithms can't take into account, like how much they travel to do these inspections. And yet, few of the department or the, the few departments that did uh, try using algorithms reported very similar issues with managerial discretion as the ones that we observed in our pilot, which potentially suggests that inspectors were also not using their decision authority to improve the decision in these two hypothesized ways. So together, these interviews suggest that while organizations might commonly place high value in algorithmic sophistication, rethinking how to allocate and manage decision authority might merit more serious consideration from organizations that are thinking about using algorithms as decision aids. Okay, so to recap, uh, we find that using algorithms to inform decision making can provide large gains relative to human decision makers alone and that much of these gains can come from simply integrating data into the process, at least in this context. And rather than improving the decision by um, overseeing the algorithmic inputs, we see that decision makers use their decision authority to dissipate any informational gains from the algorithms. Now, of course, our analysis has a number of limitations, and a key one that I've sort of mentioned throughout is that this is just one specific data set in one specific context. And this decision context is characterized by um, what I'd call moderate complexity with some costs for mistakes that make some degree of human supervision valuable. And our findings might be more generalizable to similar contexts, whereas um, in settings with, say, higher complexity and richer data, the benefits of algorithmic inputs and algorithmic sophistication might be higher than what we find here. But what we really hope is that there are many more studies that look at the effects of algorithmic sophistication across many different contexts. And overall, what these findings highlight is that organizations might need to think carefully about the returns to algorithmic sophistication in each context uh, for these managerial decisions. And a key factor that we need to think about is how to allocate and manage decision authority, which we really find to be a much more of a first order issue here. And given that the default arrangement across most organizations today is to allocate final decision authority to managers so that they can correct any problematic recommendations or better inform the decisions according to um, other or, or broader organizational objectives, these findings basically suggest that organizations need to think carefully about designing the process of how managers work with algorithms as decision aids.
And in fact, the city continued to explore the use of algorithms after this pilot for a few years. And they tried using, uh, or they tried a couple of different things like communicating that they were using algorithms and providing feedback on their effectiveness. But for a, a number of reasons, they ultimately discontinued the program and returned to their old system, which didn't actually use any, any data to prioritize inspections. And so this is also more broadly consistent with the large literature on the importance of complementary investments and practices that ultimately shape the returns to technology. And I think what this highlights is that, of course, there's growing work on how to increase trust in algorithms. But the solution is unlikely to be as simple as you know, getting decision makers to blindly trust in algorithms or completely removing decision authority from, from decision makers in most of these cases. And this points to two potential areas that might be fruitful understanding for understanding uh, where some of these complementary investments might be useful. Uh, the first is in terms of increasing investments in human capital, say through increased training of decision makers or complementary management practices to help them uh, to learn better uh, or to learn to better inform their decisions using data. And in some of my other work, I've also explored how uh, you know, thinking about uh, getting managers to pay attention can be much more important than just making information available. And then second, exploring how the decision process can be redesigned might be a promising direction to explore. So while most organizations are defaulting to providing decision makers with algorithmic recommendations, there's other possibilities like incorporating human preferences into algorithms or aggregating human and algorithmic predictions in some other ways that could potentially provide better options for decision making in some contexts. Okay. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to stop here um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. Awesome, thanks so much. It's really incredibly interesting work. So um, we'll have, have a question by Renuka to unmute you. Uh, hi, uh, Hyunjin, thank you for the great presentation. So my question was uh, regarding this aspect about uh, just adding on to Tommy's question. Uh, he was asked, uh, like, uh, you had talked about how the inspectors are rotated every two years and things like that. But in a way, if you look at it, it's a community, right? You have the entire workforce that communicates with each other. They kind of know how each things work. And this might actually be affecting which place they go to and things like that. So even if in that context, we cannot exactly take away bribery concept as such. And also the other thing that I was thinking about is how if bribery was involved and if there is a possibility that uh, certain of those places that have problems are not even entering the data. So in that case, our historical data, which forms the basis of the algorithm itself will be a problematic way to frame it. That was one question I had. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll first address the first question and then and then I'll get back to you about the second one. I'd actually love to um, hear a little bit more about what you have in mind. Um, okay. So in terms of uh, how the inspectors are being rotated and really thinking about, you know, is it the case that, you know, even if individual inspectors might not have um, the ability to, to build some of these relationships, might it be the case that there are some social relationships across yes. inspectors and yeah, really yeah, share exactly. the knowledge? I think it's totally possible Possible. I think if this were happening, what we should see is when we look at the distribution of inspections across restaurants, that there are some restaurants that are constantly being inspected and mm -hmm. other restaurants that are not being inspected at all. If there's some coordination, you know, over the years, we don't find that this is really happening. What we see is that the majority of restaurants will get inspected, you know, a maximum once or, or not at all, because inspectors are really sort of trying to balance their scarce time. Because of course, you know, all of their time isn't just spent on inspecting these restaurants. They also have, you know, other sort of what they call higher priority institutions like nursing homes or, you know, school kitchens that they need to inspect in addition to this. Um, and so I think it's definitely possible. We don't see a ton of evidence in this context that at least some restaurants seem to be getting disproportionately targeted or not targeted over time. And then, sorry, in terms of the second question, um, can you tell me a little bit more about what you had in mind? So in one case, I was thinking about how the inspection keeps happening, but that doesn't necessarily 
turn out into a data point wherein there was any kind of uh, like mismanagement that was happening at all in the first place. So you have the inspection happening from a, maybe a bribery context, context in itself. So you have repeated or people going into a particular restaurant regularly from a more bribery context, not exactly addressing the main purpose of why they're going. So you have the travel happening, but not exactly a data being created. Like it's a very roundabout way, I suppose, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I don't think bribery is something that we can uh, directly- We cannot address. exactly address with uh, this thing. And the other aspect I was thinking about is like how geographically, if it is, uh, let's say the restaurant is in a problematic place, you have certain higher incidents of crime happening or something of that kind. Even if the algorithm predicts it, you might not exactly want, the inspectors might not prefer to go there. And so they prefer their own things. So those are just certain things that I was thinking might be uh, playing a role in the inspector's discretion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much. I think in a lot of these, you would have to think about what the patterns of inspection should look like. So even okay. if it were, you know, this sort of coming from some of these disparities in areas, then you would also expect to see that either say the zip code matters or yeah. that, you know, if you look at the distribution, some restaurants are being disproportionately targeted while others are not over the yeah. years. Um, but I think that these are definitely alternatives that, you know, we can't fully rule out because we're not directly observing them. Yeah. One more uh, question I had was like, uh, you, so after the inspectors have actually been, like when they inspect, do you add it to your existing algorithm to improve the weights or it just stays that way? No, we actually held the algorithms constant. This was actually something that we thought a lot about. Okay. Um, and we didn't want to continue updating it through the, the implementation that we had. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Got it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So uh, up next is Raphael. Thank you. And a very interesting and, and great talk. I was wondering, uh, what is the role, what role does it play the fact that algorithms kind of like predict two things simultaneously? They predict visits and uh, violations. So if we could somehow disentangle these two, like if, if algorithms could separate visit, the, like the probability of violations versus the probability of visiting, to what extent would things be different? Hmm. So is what you have in mind that the reason that the algorithms are predicting both, you know, visits and violations rather than just violations alone, really thinking about just the, the degree of precision. So the, the algorithms aren't actually predicting the number of visits that happen to, to a restaurant, but maybe what you're getting at is by predicting the number of violations that they expect for given establishment, there is varying degrees of precision. You know, if you had many uh, inspections in the past versus if this is a totally new restaurant that hasn't gotten inspected. Is that what you have in mind? Yeah, what I have in mind is that the algorithms cannot fully, like, like they predict violations conditional on a visit. And I don't know if, uh, you know, what we would like is to have an algorithm that predicts kind of like the unconditional violations. And if we could have like this algorithm that separates this selection problem, then maybe, you know, the, the inspectors in that case would pay more attention to, to what the algorithm says. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a good point. Um, because, you know, they think the precision around each of the estimates are going to vary. And of course, if there is, you know, if there are establishments where there have been no inspection so far, neither the algorithm nor the inspector really has a prior um, or a very informed prior, I should say, on the number of violations that they're likely to have. Um, I'm trying to think about, you know, how this would have entered in in this particular case. I think one of the nice things that we had was that, you know, these inspections have been going on for, I mean, for many, many years, and we have all of the historical data. So within, say, a span of a couple of years, all the restaurants have been inspected. Say within two years, uh, they've all been inspected at least once. So I don't think that it should have affected them uh, the, the, the degree of precision so much. But I think that this is an important point when we think about uh, you know, forming any kind of algorithmic recommendations in terms of, you know, what is the, the prior selection uh, that we might not actually be taking into account here in terms of what the predictions are actually spitting out? Yeah, yeah it could be that the inspectors are trying to kind of like explore, do some exploration to, to build their priors or something. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting, thanks. All right, so next up is Mike Ward. 
I, I thought I understood that the experiments finished at some point. So you have post-experiment period so that you can actually explore then the uninspected restaurants, what happened to their score in the post period to see if there is some sort of selection away from the uh, ones that had violations or not. So you can, you have a recommendation during this period and then after that period, uh, you, can, you can see they will eventually get inspected. And yes. if there's some persistence in health violations, I don't know. Right, no, that's a really good idea. Uh, we try to do this. We would love to do this. Actually, after we ran the experiment, there was a change in um, the mayor and the rest of the organization. Uh, and so we actually haven't, we were hoping to actually do a series of pilots around this. And we haven't been able to get back to some of the data or actually some of the interviews. But I think that eventually, you know, some of this data is publicly available or gets publicly released. Um, so we're hoping to be able to, to you know, address that selection issue more thoroughly. That way you can kind of do a diff and diff. Yeah, thanks. All right, so Pallavi. Hi, Angel. Um, yeah, so this is um, interesting. I have a question related to the second um, regression results where you like sort of interacted with the rank. Um, I, I, I think the rank is the rank from the algorithm, right? Where you sort of... Yeah, it's the rank from really, uh, you know, any of the, the methods in terms of com co uh, comparing, uh, you know, whether or not they're ranked from the algorithms. Um, okay interact with uh, um, whether it's in the algorithm or not. Yes, exactly. Oh. Um, and, and just basically to see, okay, does rank say for the inspector decisions um, have implications for the number of violations that are found? And if we interact it with whether or not this was one of the algorithmic recommendations, do the gains actually vary across that ranking distribution? But like if you, but that result sort of just says that the rank in the algorithm really doesn't predict the violation, right? Like, I mean, I'm guessing if it's a higher ranked restaurant, it should have, um, you know, more right. Impact. So here you control for rank in the sense that, you know, you know, is it the case that with, with the rank, you have more violations? But what you're really picking up on on those two coefficients that I was showing was, is it the case that, say, as we go, you know, say, down the distribution or, say, from the very top of the distribution, that they're picking up on much larger gains? So there are much, you know, larger violations that they're finding um, relative in terms of the difference uh, with the, the comparable rank for the inspector ranked restaurants. So really thinking about are the gains from the algorithms when we compare rank um, getting larger uh, compared to the inspector's ranking um, uh, you know, over that ranking distribution. So the ranking is for the inspector's ranking or the algorithm ranking? So it, it's both, right? So we have rank for oh, okay. each of the three methods in terms of for a given restaurant, like what is the top 20 ranked restaurants from the inspectors, say, you know, and okay. versus the top 20 yeah. ranked each of the methods. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, maybe it would be interesting to also sort of see how good the ranking predictions are for, for the data set that you have, right? Like right now you just have like more of like, it was the algorithm good enough to predict that this, uh, this restaurant would have a violation, but I'm sure the algorithm must have also given a ranking. And if those rankings are actually what you saw, like, like a higher ranked restaurant did have a higher violation versus a restaurant which was lower ranked. Yes, um, uh, definitely. And we do see that I think on average uh, for, Actually, probably to some extent, both algorithms and inspectors that, you know, as you go down the, the ranking uh, that they are, you know, maybe on average more likely to have smaller violations. Um, but there might be some sort of bigger jumps across if you go even lower in terms of the ranking distribution here. OK, OK. And then uh, I have one more. In the survey that you did, did you said that a lot of departments had similar like they reported similar problems when they were trying to use algorithm, right? Um, do you like get more detail in that survey or is it more like, um, for example, what type of restaurants are there? I'm just thinking maybe you can get a bit more information there of 
um maybe it's like the type of work or the type of sort of inspection that does need uh where the inspector might be more willing to trust their own judgment versus others and um in other cases they might trust the data more was there like yeah so so here are these weren't actually surveys but we did like about an hour long interview i would say with each department so we ha- have a lot of you know, richness. I think the question is, how do we want to actually sum this up in terms of the summary statistics? Um, and what is kind of interesting is some of these departments actually also shared their the, the data that they had about, you know, which inspectors followed the recommendations, how much did they, was there any heterogeneity? And we don't see actually a lot of heterogeneity in, in our context, really at all across the inspectors. And in general, from what I saw, I think that in, in some departments, they also don't see too much heterogeneity, but there might be some heterogeneity along lines of tenure. So where maybe newer inspectors or um, you know, more experienced inspectors, I think, in one department were more likely to follow the algorithmic recommendations slightly uh, compared to those that were really mid-career that were least likely to follow some of the algorithmic in, recommendations. In, in these interviews, did you like ask them questions about like how much information was given to the inspectors about how the algorithm was like um, derived and stuff like that. Yeah, we did. Um, so it was actually pretty interesting, these interviews, I have to say. And, you know, one of the departments in particular, they actually tried two different types of algorithms. Like one was, uh, I think, joint with Google, like using their local businesses data. Another one was with the CDC and Twitter. And so they were pretty transparent about you know, what these algorithms were when they piloted it across their own inspectors. So there is a ton of actually richness in these interviews. We just need to figure out how are we going to actually show this um, in, that in would the paper. Be, I think that would be interesting to see if like those things, because you do have like more data in these like phone calls that you can potentially use to get more information. Yeah, it's true. Thanks. Yeah, qualitative information is is super interesting, but sometimes hard, I think, to, to work with, <laughs> at least for me. 